What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Seven Figure Flipping Podcast. This is Bill Allen. On today's show, I have a power couple from San Diego, California. They are incredible. They run individually, each run their own business, and they've just started flipping houses together. And we're doing another deal breakdown. And um, you'll see, they just they started with this deal thinking they're going to even like make ten thousand, maybe twenty thousand dollars, and it didn't turn out that way. So at the end, we break down all the numbers everything, how they found the deal, how they funded it, how they negotiated it, uh, the rehab budget, the rehab costs, lessons learned along the way, what they sold it for, everything. So you're not going to want to miss this because it's going to give you a lot of coaching, a lot of training, and a lot of ideas about what you can do in the future. My name is Bill Allen, and I'm the leader of a group of elite house flippers and wholesalers called Seven Figure Flipping. We don't brag or show off our success, but instead let integrity and stewardship be our guide. We are dedicated to helping people unlock the freedom they desperately need. If you ask other real estate investors, they will say to keep your secrets quiet. But we believe in abundance, not scarcity. And that's why we are the elite. We are Seven Figure Flipping, and this podcast is our playbook. What's everybody? I got a great show for you today. We're actually diving back into these um, deal breakdowns. So I love these deal breakdowns. I'm having so much fun talking to some of our members about some deals that they've done. I've learned a ton on this, uh, some lessons that I've learned that I had never heard of, some tips, some tricks, things like that. And I'm sure today will be very similar. So uh, on today's show, I have a couple that are going to talk to you about some of their um, the, the business that they are doing together and potentially some of the other things that they're doing. But uh, today I have Mike and Mel. What's up, guys? How are you? Hey, good. How are you doing? Doing great. I'm doing great. I'm actually excited to have you guys. This is your first podcast? Our very first one. We're newbies. So thank you for having us. Well, you're welcome. Let's see how you do. I'll give you a score from one to 10 at the end and I'll let everybody else tell us in the comments how you did. But okay. um, I've already 11. had fun talking to you guys for like five or 10 minutes before we even record. So <laughs> um, can you give a everybody a little background on on each of you? Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Michael Grace. Um, I have a film production company. Uh, we've done a lot of work over the years with uh, HETV and the like. And I um, married to this beautiful lovely lady Mel here, uh, who has a property management company on her own. Uh, she comes from a family of like real estate. Uh, her dad, mom, brother, they're all in it. Um, been in it for years. And uh, with my HETV ties with film production, I've been filming hundreds, if not thousands of homes and seeing all the cool tips and tricks and ways to uh, make a, an old home beautiful again. So now we're combining our forces and our expertise, and we're creating a fix and flip company here in Southern California. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I, I really have spent the lion's share of my career in the corporate world doing marketing for Fortune 500 companies. But about five years ago, my, my father, unfortunately, became ill, and, and he gifted me this opportunity to come into the family business and take over the property management side. So I took all, everything I've learned in the corporate world. I love to systematize. I love my Excel spreadsheets. Uh, I love my, my formal uh, conference calls with my team. So I took that and I, I infused it into the property management world. And we take care of so many other people's homes and investments that we thought, okay, it's time for us to do this for ourselves. And so we have our flip company. It's called Taco Sid Properties. In honor of my dad, he loved tacos. <laughs> so <laughs> it's Taco Sid Properties, LLC. And we're doing it together. Cool. Okay, so film production company and seeing HGTV and then five years in property management, real estate background, and you have a marketing background. Um, why didn't you guys do this before? Like, why now? That's a really good question. Um, I, I've done it in a roundabout way many, many years ago. I think I bought my first home when I was 19. And it was during an era where you could get into a home for 5K. And so I bought it. It was every dollar that I had. I rented it out. I went to college and then I sold it and I paid off my student loans. So that was my first experience. But I also, since I grew up in a real estate family, I could see how volatile real estate is. You know, it's not a, my dad would always say, it's not for the faint of heart. And if it were easy, everybody would do it. So I kind of ran the direct opposite direction and said, no, I'm going for security. I'm going big corporate. And then I learned that there's no security in big corporate. There can be a reorg, there can be layoffs, like there's no security there. Why not just do it for ourselves and put all this time and effort that I'm spending into a W-2 for myself? And I think when you have a big life event, like a loved one passing, it's time to reflect and go, okay, how can I 
change the trajectory of my life and do this. And so that's why I jumped in. And then, yeah, I think, I think the reflection part of life is, is kind of paramount here. Um, we have a, a eight year old son. Um, I coach his little league team, uh, which takes a little too much time, uh, according to Mal. A lot of time. <laughs> and you know, the, I feel like we have one chance at life with our kid and with, my film production background, like we're traveling all over the U.S., all over the world for weeks at a time. There's been a couple of months where I'm here for two days. And that's just not sustainable and it's not the life we want to live uh, as a family uh, with our with our son growing up a little too fast. And we'll tell you, Bill, and maybe I'm jumping ahead, but when we started doing this and when we worked on our first one, which I know we'll get to, the coolest thing for me is that as a family, we were together in Arizona for spring training. So we're having this nice family time, this nice family moment while working on our flip, answering calls from the realtors, selling it. And we didn't take away from any of our family time. And in our other lives, that that's just not that's not the equation that works. So if we can make this more of a focus and make it our main business. So now we have three, then that would be huge because we get all the time um, that we can have with our kid. Cause it's, 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 it's short, you know, he's eight. I feel like his childhood is halfway over. <laughs> and so we don't want to miss anything. So this would afford us that opportunity to be together while making money. So like doing this third thing actually gave you more time. Do, I think so. I Believe it or not. Yeah. So, um, just on my side, I, you know, I'm busy running a house flip project. Um, and in doing that, I can see the margin starting to grow and I can turn down some film projects so I don't have to travel as much. So I, I think that alone uh, saves us more time just traveling way less than, than I need to. Yeah. And then with my business, you know, I've worked for five years to operationalize it and systematize it. So when I started, everybody told me, sell, sell, sell. And I said, no, I need to make sure that my operations are good, that our foundation is good so that we can scale. And we're there. So it's a really good time for me while things are running and I, I come in for, you know, if things need to get escalated or emergencies or to help with some crisis communication. But other than that, you know, the team is set, our, our process is solid. So I have the time to, to devote more of my bandwidth mm -hmm. to doing something together. And how do you guys like working together? Uh, <laughs> it, it, at times it's challenges, but I don't know. We work through everything pretty well. Well, and I think we're lucky that we have different strengths. So yeah. I, I prefer to be behind the scenes and running the project and, and crunching the numbers and making sure that we're on time, we're on budget. And Mike is more, um, you're working with everybody. You're on the ground, actually working with the contractors and you're seeing the creative vision and he's doing the video for the home mm -hmm. and he's doing the marketing for the home. So we have different skill sets, which is nice. Yeah. Very, I mean, very compatible skill sets that make us a pretty formidable team. I think, you know, I'm more kind of creative side, um, that, that kind of thinking and Mel's very analytical number crunching, make sure that we're not spending too much money on different finishes. <laughs> no, we will not get that fancy back backsplash. It's <laughs> not in the budget. So. <laughs> Yeah, well, if it's any consolation, I over renovated my first few houses a ton, spent way more money than I should have and made less than I should have because I thought I was living in them and not uh, selling them to somebody else. So um, I think that's a, a normal thing. Everybody wants that backsplash, by the way. Um, OK, so let's let's talk about this deal. I'd love to hear about it. Um, uh, let's let's go from like where it came from. Like, how did you guys find it? And w was this your first? This is your first actual flip that you did? Uh, no, we we've done. Well, this is our third flip. Uh, we did two in Kokomo, Indiana, of all places, and we learned very quickly: don't do a flip uh, if you can't actually drive to it and check it out. For us, uh, for us, at, at anyway. the stage yeah. that we're at. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is our first one while with Seven F um, in here in California. And we, it was a much smoother process than the, the Indiana ones. But so the way we I found thought Kokomo this, was like a place in Hawaii that the Beach Boys sang about. <laughs> that, that's, that's the nice Kokomo. We can't afford to flip there. Uh, Indiana, you have some opportunities um, with very low, very low ways to get in. Uh, but so like I was saying before, Mel's family's real estate. Her brother is actually in the altitude program uh, with you guys. Uh, shout out to Adam Kuchek. And uh, he and I visited this property in Barstow. We looked at it. He didn't think the margin was there for, for his time. And he had some money tied up in two or three other properties uh, at, going on at the same time. 
And so Mel and I thought, well, heck, you know, maybe we'll make 15, 20 grand on this. Honestly, um, I thought maybe we would make 10, but yeah. our attitude was we're going to get paid to learn. Right. Even if we walk away with 5K, mm -hmm. that's fine. Just, just learn the process, dive in. We're drinking from the fire hose. It was before we could even really get into our curriculum with 7F or even our groups. Right. And we just probably do everything backwards, you know, <laughs> not prepared. We just dove in and thought, all right, we'll get paid to learn. And, and that's what we did. That's right. And then in this home, you could tell it had a good bones to it. Uh, and the, the folks that lived there, they were, I'm not sure what was going on in their lives, but they needed to move out quickly and they're moving to, to Nevada. And so looking at the, the age of the home um, and the repairs that were needed, we we're able to make a pretty good cash offer. Uh, I forget what we offered. Numbers girl. <laughs> so we, we ended at 128. And there was a bit of negotiation because this house had solar. And so this, this seller still had um, seller, uh, solar payments due, but on his credit card, I think about 14 or 15 grand. Right. And we just told him, look, the deal doesn't work. If we have to absorb that solar cost, then the numbers just aren't there. And so he said, no, I'll take care of it. It's on my credit card anyways. It doesn't impact the home. And so we, we were able to negotiate and, and buy it for 128. And so, uh, so it sounds like this lead came to your brother, Adam. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then he was like, the numbers don't work. You guys take it. And yeah, so he just, he, he was it was like, a direct hey. marketing lead that he just kind of handed off to you. Exactly. So yep. he looked at the numbers and for where he's at, I mean, he's in altitude. He's like, this isn't really worth my time. He was like, no offense, you know, you guys, it's not really worth my time, but if you want to take it on, you know, I'm happy to, I'm going to pass on it. And so we said, well, okay, again, even if we walk away with $5,000, we're going to pay, we're going to get paid to learn. Right. So let's just take it and see what we can do with it. And so we so, took it. So he introduced you to the seller and then just said, you, you take it from here. Did he give you any information, background? Like I, I realize I'm getting into some details, but mm -hmm. I think it, what's really important for somebody who's just learning this business or wants to get going into it. I'd say when I, I remember reading a book about like, where the leads came from, what he, what people were saying to them. And that's the area that just seems so foreign to me mm -hmm. of like my first deal. I was like, wait a second. Like I have to, I talk directly to the seller. There's no real estate agent. It's not listed on the market. Like this doesn't make sense. Uh, this is scary. It's on. Un, un, so I think this is the area where if we spend a little bit of time, yeah. with somebody, so, so like he talked to the seller. So he had a bunch of information. Probably you mm -hmm. said he's an out, he's an out dude. He's doing a lot of deals. So he's, he's probably got a CRM and all this stuff. So did he give you all that information? So you went in there knowing, and then well, you do it like a no, warm no, no, handoff really. or was he just like, here no. you go. Good luck. Honestly, yeah, well, he, he's, sorry, yeah, he's the one that told us to sign up with you guys. Cause he's like, I'm not a coach. I don't know how to teach you what I've been doing because I've been doing it for five or 10 years and it's muscle memory. I can't, I just, you, you gotta mm -hmm. go sign up for coaching. So that was right. So, so <laughs> that's his approach. Yeah. So he didn't really give us any information. We, he and I viewed the property together, um, uh, the first time and we were working with the folks that, you know, we, we heard their story. They're trying to get out of this house. They need to move to Nevada for whatever's going on. And I think, both Mel and I, we kind of approach our other businesses like in a service capacity, right? Like, how can we help? What can we do to help? Um, it's been really it's great for film production. It's great for property management. And then we saw an opportunity here. It's like, well, we can help this family get out of Barstow, California and move to Nevada to be closer to, I guess, their family or whatever was going on. And But we can help. We're not a charity organization. The only way we could help is by giving them cash. Uh, for their home, but then we need to make sure we have the margin on there uh, after repair. So the one big bit of help I, we did get from your brother was being able to walk the house. He's flipped, I don't know, a hundred homes in his life, I guess. And so he's able to instantly say, all right, new kitchen, X amount. Uh, this roof looks good, but we need an inspector, X amount. You know, foundation was good. So we're able to just, like click off the list really fast what the approximate budget would be uh, to, to mitigated some of the risk, Correct. having him walk the property and go, yeah, I, I think this is a, mm -hmm. a solid home, but the margin isn't there for me to even really, you know, do anything with right. it. Um, but you know, I thought he was really helpful and right. And I think what made it really easy for us is, you know, there's no, either the numbers work or they don't, right. It's very black and white, uh, versus any, having any sort of emotional tie. Like obviously we want to help these folks out, but looking at it, we could crunch our numbers and say, this is exactly what we can offer. We could offer cash because it's cash. We could give it to you in what it was like a week. 
And uh, they were very happy to take it and move on with their lives to go on to the next chapter of their lives, whatever they're, they're doing. Well, and when we originally looked at the deal, our plan was to do hard money right. for the purchase and then use our private money for the rehab. And so, okay, before we get there, I have a couple more questions. So yes. we'll move to that next. So I like, so you walked the property with Adam, he went through all of the kind of numbers and the, those kind of things you saw it. And then he went home, ran his numbers and said, this is not for me, but you can take it. So then did you sit down with the seller again? You had to negotiate with them. Uh, like what was that process like? How long did it take? Yeah. So at, at this point, the homeowner was already in Nevada. They took off. So just a few phone calls after that. Uh, it was Adam, myself, and the homeowner on the call uh, talking through. We explained kind of where we're at price-wise, the rationale why, uh, so they could understand we're not just some big, giant company trying to like rip people off. But instead, this is what we can offer because we are you know, going to flip it and try to make a couple bucks ourselves. And I don't know, again, maybe we're just lucky. But it could be a unicorn. I don't know. <laughs> but but <laughs> it just worked not. out. It worked out really well. The, the, the homeowner took her offer and we were able to send them whatever it was, $128,000 in two weeks. And, and because I should back up, because we already had our LLC hmm. established from doing the flips in Kokomo, Indiana, we have that established. I'm a licensed agent. I've, I've had my license forever. So we, we had those key components already lined up to be able to facilitate this deal. Um, mm -hmm. And just get it going. Right. But there's still a time. What, what was the homeowner asking? Maybe I missed it. What were they asking for? The uh, you know, that's a good question. I'm not sure if, because it was an off market house. I think originally he wanted 165. And okay. part 165? of that. Mm -hmm, and part of that was to offset. He owed about 15K for the solar. Right. Um, and so I think that's what, that was his, you know, asking price at, at the very beginning. But then when we just Got broke it, it down. And I think he was talking to a few other people who, who may have required getting a loan to purchase it. And when we came in with all cash, you know, it kind of just sealed the deal. But we, but again, we had a stipulation of you, you've got to take care of that solar cost. This doesn't work for us if we have to absorb that cost. Right. Cool. Okay. So 128, mm -hmm. 128,000. Um, and then he took care of the solar contract. Okay. So you got all that done. You closed in two weeks. It sounded like you were, I was going to ask you, uh, what did you think that the rehab estimate was going to be after walking through? Like, not how much you actually spent. So how much did you think that you were going to spend? So, like, what was the budget look like? Yeah, we, we were thinking we would spend 35. Okay. And then the contractor's estimate came back. I think he came back originally at 42, and, and but we had received two bids. So he came back at 42, and I said, well, we'd really like to be at 35. And then we met in the middle at 38. Okay, so the contractor walked through, you you estimated it a little bit like with Adam and then walking through and kind of looking at it, you estimated it'd be 35K, mm -hmm. contractor came, he bit, he quoted 42K mm -hmm. and you guys kind of worked together yeah. uh, to get to 38K was yeah. the estimate yeah. before you guys started. I think it was- And so you're working off of 128,000 purchase, $38,000 rehab estimate, and then how much did you think it was gonna sell for? At the time, we thought it would sell for 220, that's, those are okay. the numbers that we were, we were like, we're lucky if we get 220, you know, for it. And this was at the beginning. Okay. So we're still at the beginning. Let's stay there for now. Let's not, there's a big reveal at the end. So everybody's <laughs> going to keep listening to you guys. So we got $128,000 purchase, $38,000 rehab budget. And so that's what, uh, 166, 166K with a ARV of 220. So you guys were thinking you're going to make like 35 K on it about, I mean, we had to figure in real estate costs and that was an unknown to us. So we were being really conservative. We thought, okay, maybe our costs, because at the end of the day, we picked it up for 128, but with our realtor fees, it ended up at 132 out the door. And, and then we also were considering our hard money lender, right? What, right, what that time. interest would, would be. And then carrying the house. So how much profit did you think you were going to make? We honestly thought we would be lucky if we walked away with 20 K. Right. Okay. And again, Profit. we were willing to do it for 10. So we thought oh, as long sure. as we make at minimum 10 to learn this process, we're good. But maybe we'll make 20. Good attitude to have. So profit 20. I, it looks to me like I'd be expecting to make like 30 with these numbers. 166. Yeah, you have closing costs and hard money costs and holding costs and stuff like that. Um, if I run the numbers, I, I'm getting like somewhere like 30K. Mm-hmm. 
Um, You've been doing this a little case. longer than we have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. How long did you think it was going to take from start to finish? Uh, talking with our, our GC, like we thought it'd be about a two and a half Well, he month said process. six weeks. Yeah. So we closed escrow mid-December. Um, the GC wasn't available until mid January because of the holidays and another project that he was wrapping up. So I said, okay, so from the get go, what's our schedule? What's our timeline? Break it down for me week over week. And so I took copious notes to exactly what he said would happen each week for the six weeks. And then we had a check in every week and we paid him uh, weekly as well. So it was kind of like, okay, you hit these milestones. We accomplished this. Great. Now I'm sending you your money. And so it worked out really well and we stayed on time and it was done in six weeks exactly as, as we had planned it. Okay. So like two and a half months, one month of wait time, yeah. six right. weeks of rehab, and then there's obviously like selling time. Yep. So you're probably like calculating like three and a half to four months hold time. I, yeah. Four months. I, I was hoping we would wrap it in 90 days and I knew that was a little aggressive, but that's how okay. we roll. <laughs> so cool. So I, yeah, I want to help anybody who's listening. Like the key here is the numbers that I just asked for are the numbers that I'm always looking for when I'm running the the project before I make an offer. Okay. So these are these are estimated purchase price, estimated rehab cost, closing costs, because and then hold time. Hold time is going to determine all of my variable costs. So money cost, uh, taxes, insurance. Uh, land, la landscaping, lawn care. If you're in a cold area in the winter like this, it might be snow uh, shoveling and things like that. Uh, I got utilities. There's all these things to think about that usually get lost in the HGTV show that Mike is producing. Mm -hmm. um, they don't show any of those costs. And it's like, oh, we made $60,000. Like, no, you didn't. You made 25. Yep. And um, so all that stuff that kind of gets glossed over, real estate commissions, those kind of things, um, title work, uh, points on hard money, all these kind of things. Yeah. So when I run all those numbers, yeah, I mean, if I was doing this, I'd probably be, I think I could make like 30K off this house. So maybe 25, mm -hmm. but um, it's usually like 10. Anyway, I don't want to go into the details of my numbers, but that that looks good. And I probably, uh, I probably would have done this deal myself, um, especially if I had a team and I needed to keep them busy and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So uh, okay, let's talk about what actually happened. So you closed 128, 128,000. Let's talk about how you funded it. How did you guys plan to fund it and how did you have to fund it? So we plan to fund it with, uh, we wanted to do a hard money lender for the purchase and then our own private money for the rehab. And everything looked good. We're, we're ready to get our money, money. We're going through Kiavi. And then a, a day or two before we're supposed to fund, uh, we get a note that says, you know, we, we can't service this loan. And we thought, why, you know, what's going on? Like the credits there, everything's fine. And it turns out that the seller of this property, when they originally purchased the property, they were part of some $6,000 incentive program for the city. And based on that program, part of the criteria was if you sold the home within five years of purchase, you needed to pay the city back that 6K. And for whatever reason, that 6K ran with the property, even though it's been 15 years since the homeowner purchased it. So she satisfied the criteria, doesn't have to pay it back. That 6K still ran with the property and it freaked out all the hard money lenders and nobody would loan on the property. So mm. at that point we thought, well, we don't want to lose this deal. So we did, we did private money for the whole thing. Okay. So, so th after that, so sometimes the hard money side, if it's in like a rural area, if it's too low cost, if it's got some like something weird to it, the layout is off, something pops up on title, things like that. Um, you could get somebody to like kind of pull the um, pull the the approval. Hmm. And so that's what happened, it sounds like. And then also other other places and two days before closing, you're kind of you're not in a position to go, you know. Right. attract a bunch of other hard money lenders anyway, because mm -hmm. it's going to take a couple of weeks or, or a week or two for them to close it anyway. And then you just have to extend. So you, you kind of pivoted. Did you have this backup plan in your back pocket already? Or was it like last minute scramble? Let's figure out. We, how to I mean, we, we didn't, we, we had the reserves there, but we were planning on using that for, for other things. Um, it was from the proceed of our sale from the flips in, in Kokomo. Um, but when this happened, it's like, okay, well, I guess we're all in this better work. <laughs> <laughs> there's uh there's no backup plan we're using our private funds and okay here we go let's put our money where our mouth is so oh so when you say private money you didn't actually go raise the money no. you used your own money yes 
Right. So okay. So I want to be very clear to people who are listening. A lot of times we talk about private money. We're talking about friends and family, warm network, somebody who comes in and funds it. It's like um, you're talking about using your own money. So, okay. That's right. So I figure if we're going to do a business together, what better way than to go all in <laughs> right off the get? Yeah. Got it. So it's, that's nice. I, I would say um, if you're, for the person who's listening who doesn't have the option to have a bunch of money in their bank account and this comes up, then there's absolutely the opportunity, depending on what the rates look like, what kind of terms, to go out and raise capital. And basically what you can do is you can take other people's money and put it on this property just like the bank, just like a hard money lender would be. You can give them first position mortgage on it. Um, you guys don't, don't have to do that in that case. It actually, if you use your own money, um, I'm not a big proponent of this, but you save on like doc stamps, you save on taxes, no mortgage, all of that stuff. There's not a, a lender's title policy that you buy, all kinds of things that you actually save money on the front end by doing. So if you are going to analyze whether you should use your own money or other people's money, make sure that you're looking at like, apples to apples. You're actually like comparing the two because it's not necessarily just saving, you know, the two points and 10% or whatever you're paying to a money lender, you're actually saving a lot of other stuff in the mix here. So the numbers that we actually shake out here at the end are not going to include money costs and they're not going to include um, all the savings that that you guys have. You would normally be paying all of these other, you know, kind of doc stamps on the mortgage, taxes on the mortgage, um, lender's title policy, things like that, that you got to save. So, um, okay. So use your own money and then... You closed on it. Any problems closing? Anything like that? All good. Everything was great. Like it went surprisingly smooth and and well. I think. I, well, I think if you remember the um, I probably the question that came, I know we were in spring training, so he was in baseball mode. <laughs> but uh, the question that kept coming up from the seller side, they wanted more information about the solar. True. And uh, we had to be really careful to say, you know, we, we bought the home as is. Uh, there's nothing on title with regards to uh, anything owed on the solar, but they wanted to make sure it was functional. Was it working? So they had a, a solar expert come out and test the solar. There was just a lot of emphasis on the solar, which surprised us. You're talking about when you sold it. When we were selling, when we, yes. when we were selling it. So the, the Okay, we'll get there. Oh, we'll get okay. there. So oh. you guys bought it. You closed on it. It's okay. You oh, bought yeah. it. You closed on it. I was, I was, I was certain that the solar was going to be a problem. So I want to yeah. talk about that because remember, th it's on this guy's credit card, $14,000. So anytime I hear something like that, I'm like, okay, what problem could come up? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the simulation and scenario-based training that we're doing inside the runway program is based on this. Mm -hmm. So this guy says, oh, it's on my credit card. No problem. I'll just keep paying it. And I'm like, okay, cool. Like I'm going to buy the house. I get the solar. There's no lien on it or anything like that. But what happens when this guy stops paying his credit card on the solar? He decides after he gets his $128,000, he's just going to cancel the credit card, get a new one, and then just ghost the solar company because I have the house anymore. So I'm just assuming that the worst is going to happen all the time. I don't trust anyone in this stuff. And I run through my, my, my head of like, well, what would happen if that, if that happens? Mm -hmm. Are they going to come rip the solar panels off and like repo these things and like damage my roof and not fix it? Mm -hmm. And so, um, or is this guy taking the $128,000 and I'm requiring him to pay off the solar with it, or we're going to withhold the $14,000, pay off the solar. So it's not on his credit card and then give him the oh, proceeds. Smart. So yeah. <laughs> those are some things that I'm thinking about just in my experience mm -hmm. of like, I don't want anybody tied to the property that I I'm going to own. And then I'm going to have to turn around and resell because I know that the buyers of this property down the road are going to ask me those same questions. So if I don't deal with it right now, it's going to be a problem when I sell it. And I might have to reduce the cost of the home for them when we get in negotiation or it might freak out and scare off a buyer yep. where, where what most people look at is like, Oh, this is a huge benefit. Like these things are paid off and now they get solar and I'm going to market it with solar. And um, obviously I have to disclose you're a realtor, Mel. So you know, all these things I'm gonna have to disclose all the things that I know, all of that stuff. So I can't like say, Oh yeah, it's totally paid off when I know that it's not. So I realized I just like kind of like talked for five minutes straight about this, but this is everything. People don't understand that the more information and the more questions and the more planning that you do up front, the easier things are on the back end. Yep. And so, um, so it sounds like I heard as I was saying, what if we withheld $14,000, paid off the solar and then gave him the rest? 
Um, he, it's not like they wanted all the money and they were like, oh, we'll just take care of the solar somehow. It's on my credit card. I don't really care. That's like consumer debt 101. Right. Yeah. And so you were like, that was a good idea. So I'm assuming you guys didn't do that. We did not. No, we, we trusted him that he would pay off his solar and we made sure we, we worked with the title company to make sure that nothing would show up on title. We did do that due diligence. Right. So it just wasn't, we, yeah, it was a bit risky looking back at it now. Right. Hearing everything you just said, I wish we would have heard this podcast before <laughs> we did our deal, but we we just moved forward. He had it on his credit card. Title said it wasn't an issue. And so we we proceeded and we did the rehab and we didn't really come into any ahas during the rehab other than the hot water heater, I think. Need, did we salvage that or it needed to be? Yeah, replaced? no, that, that worked. We need a new closet for it. But yeah, the, it was minor. Are you ready to dive into the rehab? I want to talk more about the. Pre- yeah, I, I really just really just did anything come up? Um, it sounded like the timeline. You gave me the timeline of six weeks. He hit the mm-hmm. timeline. What about the budget? Did he hit the budget? Was there anything that you like learned along the way that would be very great wisdom to share with the people that are listening? Uh, yeah, I think um, one thing I learned was. Uh, contractors kind of work at their own pace and they have their own methodology and it's far different from the way I think uh, things should go um, and way different than Mel's. Yeah, that's where you asked about a little bit of friction. So I, I would, I would manage things differently than Mike would. Mike is more of, not that you're like, Hey bro, you got this, but you just, it's, I don't know, maybe it's man to man talk. It's a little different. And I'm, I'm a little more like, no, show me line item by line item where we are, what needs to be. I'm, I'm just more of a micro manager and I had to lay off because that wasn't his relationship with the contractor. He had much more of a a give and take. And I will say that after everything was done, there was one point of contention there. Mike walked the house and there were a couple areas that you weren't happy with. I think it was in the kitchen, some cabinetry or. Yeah. So, and I think this happens with anyone, right? So if you're working on a property for, you know, two months, right? Six weeks, wherever it is, you're basically living there every single day. You're working your tail off. You're not going to see things the way someone would, they come in with a clean slate, right? I'm going to come into a place. I'm going to look at how the crown molding lines up with the cabinets and the ceiling. It's all the seams like clean and tight and good looking. And they're just a I don't know, a ton of just tiny, tiny little imperfections that, you know, when when we're flipping a house, I want to make it as nice as we can, you know, on a budget. I want to be able to live there, you know, myself. Be proud it's, of it. it's, it's up to our standards. Be proud right? of it, yeah. And so there were just a few things that weren't up to our standards. And, you know, I think the contractor understands that there's a lot of business coming his way. Uh, they they make us happy. So so we, we ended up having to play bad cop, good cop, which was a good feather in our cap because we, Mike said, Hey, you know, please fix these things before the final payment. He said, okay, okay, we'll do it tomorrow. And we obviously asked for photos because this property, our buy box, we wanted to be able to drive to the property within three hours. So this property is in, it's three hours from where we live. So it's it's quite a drive. So he said, please send us photographs of the, of the finished product. And when he sent photographs, I looked at it and thought, Oh, these must be the wrong photographs. These can't be the final that he repaired from yesterday. So I was able to get on a text thread and kind of throw some shade on both of them. Like, gentlemen, please tell me these aren't the final photos, right? You, you sent me the wrong ones, correct? And, and so to both of them, so that the contractor wasn't feeling, you know, so much heat from both of us. And then he said, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll go fix this right away. And he had to go back again. And then he fixed it and it was fine. I'm obviously used to the heat. Uh, <laughs> I try to save the contractor a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like you guys have a good, like the good cop, bad cop side, but you have a detail oriented person and you have more of a creative, like you talked about before. Right. And, um, I think there's a way to use that to sometimes like, if you just like beat somebody all the time and like, Hey, this week you said you're going to have this, you didn't have it done this week. You say you're going to have this, you didn't have it done. And that's the relationship that you have. It's, it's not been, it's not going to be overly beneficial. It's going to be very much of like, uh, uh, you versus me, not like yeah. a we together. Mm-hmm. And then there's also just not, you just can't like, like have the bromance with them nonstop either. Like you talked about. Right. So it's just somewhere happy in the middle, which I think it sounds like you both bring a really good, uh, dose of each, uh, to the table. So I would say definitely, uh, use that to your advantage down the road. Um, I- I've heard something in the past, like over and over and over again, it's like nice, fast and cheap pick right. two. Right. So you were like, I want something really nice. I want it done in six weeks and I want it really done on my budget. And so that's really hard to do. 
It's like, um, and a lot of times people think that you're like building a new house. You're not building a new house. Even new houses, they have a ton of like small imperfections and things like that. We're renovating older houses. We're putting them back together. We're making them look nice. They're not going to be perfect. There are going to be some things that are mm -hmm. off. And I think people walk into these houses and think that it's a brand new house where it's not. Like we do the best that we can. It's a great house. It's put together well. And um, you, usually what I did was I, I would stage the property primarily not, not so that they would see the furniture and all that stuff, but honestly, so they wouldn't walk through a vacant home and just find all the small, tiny imperfections mm -hmm. that mean nothing. Mm -hmm. And That's so right. what the, what furniture does and things like that is it really takes your eyes off of um, what the house looks like empty with all the imperfections, small little things that you can find and make it feel like somebody's living there. You walk in my house right now. There's so much clutter in my house right now. You couldn't see any of the imperfections, not scratches <laughs> on the floor, the, the hole that my son put in the in the wall that we like move a you know, dining room <laughs> like. I don't know, one of these like cabinets in front of and stuff like that. So um, you might not even see that stuff, but of course you would if it was totally empty. So, okay, six weeks. Was he on budget? Did he hit $38,000? He was. His, his original budget, to be precise, it was thirty eight nine twenty, And so uh, he was pretty on budget. And, and this is one of the things I think was a good learning for us. It's so easy when you're, at least for us, when you're in the middle of a project to, oh, let's add some backsplash or let's do this. Let's make it look really nice. And I, my job was to rein it in and be the keeper of the budget and say, no, the stuff you bought came with backsplash. I don't want to spending another $1,200 on this because again, we're thinking we're going to walk away with 10, maybe 20 K if we're lucky, the margins yeah. are so, are so sharp that like, no, yeah. we don't, this isn't going to earn us a big jump on the sale of the home. So we're not doing the backsplash. Um, so he came in, so it was 38, 920. We had to do a couple extra things like build a closet for the hot water heater, we had new hot water heater closet, which was um, 500 bucks or something. And then we needed a new trim around the garage door. Uh, it was just kind of wood rot. A few things that were overlooked in the initial bidding process. I think we ended up at 42. 42, but that was some of our stuff. So for okay. his for his estimate, I think we ended up $1,500 over, which I think is incredible because I always plan for plus or minus 10%. So we were happy with, with where it came in. Yep. Okay. 40, I, I, I think that's incredible. Usually I hear, oh yeah, we were $20,000 over budget. So um, <laughs> well, great job. We, and we did that in Kokomo. So I think we <laughs> learned everything you're not supposed to do when we did our flips in Kokomo. So okay. I think this time it was our opportunity to correct past wrongs and learn from all those mistakes, which now I think is a big blessing that we actually experienced that in Kokomo because we really knew what not to do That's right. and to be a little bit more diligent and stay on top of it. Yeah, absolutely. So what, um, okay, you listed it, put it on the market. Did you list it yourself, Mel, or did you have somebody else? List yeah, it? no, we, we listed it ourselves. And at the time, so this was the exciting part. So by the time we got ready for market, we reassessed the market and what we were seeing blew us away. So we originally thought we would go, you know, to market at, you know, 299 mm -hmm. and after running the comps again, we went to market at 2499. And that Whoa. was a good deal. I mean, based on what was selling, what was in the area and I'll let Mike speak a little bit more yeah, to that. Yeah. Whenever we're looking at comps, we tend to make it as focused as possible, right? So we pull up the MLS, we look at a quarter mile, same stats, and see what everything is going for. And then if there's nothing that's really comparable, we expand out to half mile radius, right? Then a mile radius. So this little neighborhood, when we first drove to see it, I didn't realize it was nighttime. I didn't realize that the local schools are right down the street, like walking distance to, to these great schools in Barstow. And so that alone, I'm like, oh, goodness. Like, we were there working on the house one time, and the whole neighborhood's full of kids. I'm like, oh, goodness, I thought it was like a retirement neighborhood. <laughs> I had no idea when we bought it. And we were able to see, like, a lot of the benefits this location had, and a lot of the homes right around were selling for way more than we originally estimated back in December. And so, yeah, overnight, we was like, well, let's just add 20 grand to the sales price and well, see what happens. Why not? Let's try it. I mean, yeah. I do the same thing in my property management business. Right. Sometimes we work with clients that think that their home is valued more than the market is telling us. But I always say, well, let us run it. We'll run it for 10 days. And if we're not getting the response that I know we should be getting, then then we need to listen to the market and come down. So that was our strategy here, too. Let's let's run it. And then Mike was so smart. He, he did a video for it and he got great footage and he was so smart that he before it went on the market, you reached out to several agents in the area and sent them the video of the property just to kind of seed it. 
and, and get a little momentum going before we went live. Yeah, I figured, you know, just looking at the exterior of the house, we didn't put a lot of money into landscaping. Mm-hmm. We just kind of cleaned up the yard, uh, painted the exterior a little bit, fixed up some, like, patched up some stucco work. Uh, but if you were to drive by, I don't know, there's nothing spectacular about it. So what we wanted to do was share all the benefits of this home to the local real estate agents. Um, and it worked. Mm-hmm. So we so you it. so you made a video, you promoted it to the local real estate agents. Right. But what a lot of people do is they try to pre-sell the house. So like, get, mm-hmm. let's get a walkthrough before it goes live. So you guys built up pressure and demand, and then you listed it on the market, right? Yeah, we we literally, I think we listed it on a Monday night. Tuesday, we left for spring training. We did our 7F calls on the way. <laughs> By Wednesday, are your accountability calls? Yeah, our, yeah, our accountability calls <laughs> okay. on the way to spring training. By Wednesday, I think we had a few offers in already. We had multiple offers. We had we had soft offers in Tuesday night when we got to, when we got to, Arizona. to Arizona. Yeah. Okay. And then yeah. we were looking at them, and then Wednesday we had a couple more people look at it, and we told everybody we're we're deciding by Friday. Get you know best and final by Friday, and so Friday came and we chose the cash offer that was. Over asking price and a fourteen day close. How much was it? Two fifty seven. Have you already closed on it? By Friday? No, like it's you have the money. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We're done. Okay, I just I don't I want to make sure that we don't like. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This, this all happened what back in. This happened in March. March. Yeah. yeah in March. Okay, cool. So two hundred fifty seven thousand sold it for two week closing cash. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so. Um, so $128,000 purchase, $42,000 in rehabs. You have some holding costs. So that's one seventy. dollars closing costs on the front end. How much did you end up making on this property? $67,000. $67,000. How much would you have made if you uh, didn't use your own money? Have you run those numbers? Oh, I haven't. Have Probably not. Probably, Probably like $57K, you think? Yeah, yeah. Like yeah 10K Probably drop 10, I'd imagine, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay, so fifty-seven thousand had to use hard money. I just want to compare that mm-hmm. for the for the folks. So December to March, January, February, March, like a ninety-day hold. We did, yeah, we you know, did it in ninety days. Points. Yeah, it was exactly couple points on the front. That's like three k, maybe four k, and then yeah, maybe even less than that. Might only cost you, yeah, probably ten thousand with all the fees and things like that on the front. So fifty. Uh, okay, so biggest question I got for you. Um, what does Adam think about his decision not to buy this house now? <laughs> well, he, he's doing just fine, you know, but I do yeah. think this one sticks in his crawl a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a little bit, but he has. Okay, so cool. We'll make sure that we send him this, make sure we send him this show. So he can yeah. <laughs> all in. Um, so let's real quick, let's talk about like, you were mentioning that the buyer had some issue with the solar. Mm-hmm. Did anything come of that? Like, how did you? How do you, um, you know, avoid their issues or anything? Like yeah. That? So the buyer, they had some questions. They wanted to know, you know, the make and model, what year it was put on. Is it still in working condition? All, all great questions. All questions we had no answers for. Um, and so what we did very carefully, because we didn't want to put anything in writing that we knew something that we didn't about the home. Mike had a, you kind of had a mantra. So we bought the home as is. You know, if you would like further information, you know, you may hire an expert to come out and, and look at the property and that's fine. And we'll be more than accommodating with access. Right. And, and mm-hmm. that's what they did. So they actually had a solar expert come out. The solar expert checked out everything and it was their expense and he gave it a, a good clean bill of health and it was fine. And then the other thing we ran into, um, the request for repairs. So they, Everything was fine. It was very, very minimal, except for they noticed that some outlets in the house weren't grounded and they were asking us to correct that. And, you know, again, that wasn't something we, our contractor should have caught that uh, walking through in the beginning. So that was a good learning for us. And we've since talked to the contractor like, hey, we need to know if this is grounded or not. Of course, the work that we did was grounded, but everything else in the house that we didn't touch wasn't. Yeah, there, there were a few rooms, like we totally rehab the kitchen, but like the living area, all we did was, it was all cosmetic, right? New drywall, new flooring, painting, that whole thing. We didn't get into the uh, the electrical parts there. So yeah, we learned, uh, we should check all that before we- We should check all that. And I have to say, house. I have to give credit to 7FF because I was in my accountability call and I, 
shout out to Kara. I was talking to Kara. She's a realtor here in, in San Diego. And I said, you know, do you mind just looking at this request for repairs? Um, I'm getting some feedback just to do it all, but these seem so minor. There must be another way. And she looked at them and she said, no way. Do not do this. If you actually make these repairs, then it's going to go back and forth. Or were they made to my standards? It's going to delay your timeline. Just offer them a credit. Brilliant. Okay, sure. So we offered them a credit and we negotiated a little bit. They wanted a little more than what we were offering. And then we, we agreed on a credit and it was fine. Um, Cause they want to termite the section one termite remove, which we did. It was, it was less than $500 for the termite work. And then we gave them what a $2,000 credit. So right. at the end of the day, 2,500 really for the request for repairs. And that was the only between that and, and uh, digging into the solar. That was, that was it. Nice. Yeah. The way I feel like uh, home inspectors work is they want to justify the cost. So if they charge like $600, they want to find at least $600 of savings for the people. Mm -hmm. So um, usually they kind of like back off. At, so if there's anything like this massive safety issue and concern, um, the, the way I look at this when I was doing this all the time, I remember getting these requests for repairs, just being like, you got to be kidding me. Like, this is such a joke. These things are, there's some unbelievable stuff on there and some things that, that make sense. There's things that other people think are really cheap to do that actually cost a lot of time, effort, energy, and money. Right. And there's things that people think are really expensive that don't cost us a lot of money. So what I would try to do is I would try to understand what they think all this stuff's going to cost. Mm -hmm. And then I would figure out what I want my guys to do. And then what I figure out what to negotiate as a credit, like you talked about. Yeah. Because there's things that like, sometimes I would do something that would take us like no time to do. And they would think it's like, Amazing. impossible or really right. expensive would take forever. Mm -hmm. And then there's things that actually are, would take us forever, or I'd have to like rip a bunch of stuff out that they're probably fine living like that. It's not really a big deal, but mm -hmm. somebody scared them. And so then we just try to negotiate. I love the request, uh, like the credit for repairs. I use that all the time. Cause what it does is I don't have to bring my contractor back at all. Like yep. there's no other work that has to be done. We don't have to clean up after ourselves. None of that stuff has to happen and they're fine. They sign off on it and we can keep moving. Well, um, I'd that, much rather do that. Even if, even if it costs me a thousand dollars to do the work, but they'll take a $2,000 credit. I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm already moved on to the next one. Yep. But it, we're, we're in the same boat. They were really anxious to close quick. And so we were able to use that to our advantage and saying, Hey, here's, here's a credit. And with the interest or with the, with the, trying to close quick, let's just keep things moving instead of bringing contractors back out, ripping walls and cleaning up. Uh, it kind of worked to our advantage. I wanna yeah, because we did, done. we brought our contractor back just to estimate <laughs> what would it cost to redo all the rewiring and get these grounded. And it was gonna take time and thousands of dollars. Yep. They had to rip up the floors and the whole thing. It just, it would have ruined the whole deal. Right. And yep. so. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, the, it's the gift card mentality. You give them a credit, they're never going to use it. Like they're they're not going to fix it. They're living in there. They're perfectly happy. They have no problem. Mm -hmm. right. um, the one thing that I used to do that might be helpful to you and to other folks listening is um, when I bought the property, so I found an inspector who, um, most inspectors, they do these inspections, right? They do the inspection. Um, it takes them, you know, they're there for like, I don't know, an hour, maybe two hours, sometimes longer, uh, depending on the size of the house. But then they spend the majority of their time like putting those photos in the report and writing all this stuff and, and dealing with the paperwork of those reports. And so I, I, I said, you know what, those are like, I don't know, 450, 500 bucks, maybe they're more now. And, and maybe you can find somebody to do one for like three or 400. But what if they didn't have to write the report? What if they didn't have to do all that stuff, like all that extra work? That's all their time. Like they probably really like uncovering and exploring the house and finding these things. And so what I did was I made a deal with, um, especially when I was doing this at volume, I made a deal with a home inspector that every house that I had under contractor I was buying that he could come out and do an inspection with me there. And we would just walk through the property for like an hour and a half and he would find all the things that, that are big that I need to fix that will be called out in the future. And I just paid him 150 bucks. Hmm. I was like, hey, I know you charge like 450 for your full report, but I don't need a report. I don't need photo. I don't need any of this stuff. I'm just going to have a notepad and paper. I just want to walk through with you and you point out all the things that you find wrong. I give you 150 bucks. We're there for like in and out in an hour or two. Mm. And so I did that for every one of my flips because then what it did is things like this, like grounded outlets. So what I would do is I would take that and I would go back to the seller and be like, Hey, I found this thing that didn't come up when I walked through the property. But like I, I we found like a joist. He found a joist in the attic that was, that I would have to redo like an entire, like, huge joist that was a load bearing wall and load bearing for the house that would abs if he didn't find that i would have 
And, and I wasn't able to fix it during construction because we like ripped out walls, we tore the ceiling down, we put a new joist up there. Like it would have cost me tens of thousands of dollars to do after I was all fixed up. So did and you do this before the next inspector would have found it. Sorry, What's that? Did, did you do this? Do you do this before you even make an offer or this is after? No, you I usually make the offer. So I, I'd make the offer. We'd be all like dialed in and then I'd, I'd have the home inspector just come with me just like a contractor would and walk through it. Sometimes I would do it after closing, but usually it's like during closing. Okay. So sometimes if the deal's really good, like I don't even care if we're going to find a couple things. And then after closing, I just would do this so that I would know what a home inspector is going to hit me on at the end. You know, and then the other cool thing is I could also have him come back and do a full home inspection report potentially mm. and like hand it to the seller too, or okay. to the buyer okay. as well if I wanted to. So he, he was willing to do that to get business. And, um, and then I know it's the same home inspector. He's already given it, like mm -hmm. I fixed everything that he already called out. It's a very easy inspection for him afterwards. Yeah. Um, and he's not over there, but you know, most buyers, they want to use their own inspector, not somebody that I know. Yeah. So sure. no, that's a, a piece of advice that I did for years and years worked really well for me. 150 bucks. You find somebody who, mm -hmm. you know, and you get to know them, they do all your projects. They find, you know, a ton of stuff that just helps you along the way. So yeah. they, they would have found that ground, those grounded outlets for sure. Sure. Um, then the challenge is like we knew about it and we didn't fix it right mm, so right. Mm -hmm. those are like some of the things that you think about so not knowing about it sometimes is just as good yeah. as as like oh wait, hey we knew about that but we decided not to fix it because it was too yeah. expensive uh, but there are other ways to ground the outlet too than running all those wires and things like that there's lots of other stuff was a house built in the 60s or something it was uh late 50s yeah like 50s. yeah pretty common around that time to have yep. non-grounded outlets <laughs> it, um we see a lot of aluminum wire around that time in like the 70s that was used in pensacola so right. all things that like as you start flipping more and more in a certain area you start seeing the same things come up over and over and over again so um Cool. $67,000. That's awesome. What are you doing? Did you buy, uh, did you buy the team in Arizona, um, <laughs> while you were there or what, uh, what's the plan with the money? What's next for you? Guys? Uh, we're, we're looking for our next flip right now. We're, um, we're, we're on a whole lot of wholesaler lists, um, getting, uh, inbox full of way overpriced, uh, homes right now but uh we're just every time crunching our numbers we have our buy box we're very like resolute with that we're not gonna bend or change or get emotional about trying to get the next flip we're gonna make sure it works for us and we'll get it and keep on cool keep on. are you making an offer on all those houses that you're underwriting uh most uh not all of them typically what we do is we'll send like a quick soft offer to see if we're in the ballpark because i know the wholesalers need to make their margin and everything uh, but I show them exactly where our comps are, where our ARV is, um, based on our, our research and, you know, make a, I don't know, I, probably, I bet we make probably 30 soft offers a week. We've sent maybe two contracts, uh, two like full, like real offers, uh, so far, but. And I think well, the best piece of advice I can give you is every single one of those deals that you underwrite, you probably heard this before but just make an offer on it. If you're going to take the time to do it, you're going to analyze it. Yep. I, I mean, I don't care. The wholesaler is not, they, if they get offended, it's their problem. Right. Um, just, and you don't even have to like massively justify it to me. It's just like, Hey, here's where we're at. Yep. And then I know that you're a buyer. Like I know that you're a buyer. I know you're going to buy something, whether it's not this, you're going to buy. I would definitely like meet with those people, go to the meetups, go to the RIAs. Like I'm yep. going to Knoxville tonight to speak at a RIA. Hope I'm going to tell those people the same thing. Like you guys are all here. You're building the inventory for the flippers and the flippers are building the, the demand for the wholesalers, like just work together and, you know, figure out how to do it. So it makes the biggest piece of advice I can give. I feel, I feel like I should be taking notes right now, but <laughs> no. I guess we, we, can listen, we, we, we can watch the podcast. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's cool. We 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 found a lot of uh, tips, some things uh, along the way, and I mean, this should be like I'm learning from you. You're learning from me. It's uh, I've 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 done this a lot of times, and it's just the same thing comes up come up over and over and over again. A lot of times, sometimes we have to touch the stove before we actually listen. So um, I get it. People are gonna have trouble. They're gonna slip up. They're gonna learn. But you can't know everything. The best way to know is exactly what you guys did. You go like, hey, we might make ten or twenty thousand dollars on it, but we're gonna learn. And pretty cool. You like fell backwards into sixty-seven thousand, but you did a lot of things right. You did a lot of things right here. So, and um, our big question for you, Bill, is this the unicorn deal, or can we recreate this? 
No, you can recreate it. However, the, the challenge that you go into this is like, oh, we made $67,000. So let's look for another deal that we make this much money on. Mm -hmm. And that's where I got stuck in. I got stuck in that game of like, I made $45,000. And then I was like underwriting deals that I only make $45,000 mm -hmm. again or more. And so I passed up good opportunities. So a lot of times what might happen is you change the mindset of, it's cool if we make ten or twenty thousand dollars. We're going to learn to okay. We made sixty-seven. Now we got to go make fifty again on the next one. We're only doing deals with fat margins, mm -hmm. and then you end up doing nothing again. Yeah. Right. And it takes a long time to find one. So if you go back to that feeling of like, you know what? Wouldn't it be cool to learn um, to make twenty thousand dollars? Like, why don't you just go do that again and yeah. again and again? And then some you might make fifteen or twenty, and some you'll make seventy. Sure. And so I, really, the biggest thing that I'll that I'll give to you is. Um, I had uh, a woman come speak to our uh, our event, Flip Hacking Live, in 2020. Yeah, 2020. It was when we went to the virtual event. And uh, her name's Annie Duke. She's a poker player, a uh, <laughs> professional poker player. She's she's incredible, like one of the most brilliant people I've ever spoke to. I did a podcast with her. If you go back, it's like three and a half hours long. <laughs> and we talked for two and a half hours before we even hit record. It was like one of the best <laughs> days of my life. And... Um, she she wrote multiple books called like how to decide and um thinking in bets it's like some really great books about decision making but what she said was um if you have she's like she asked me how many how many houses have you lost money on and at the time i think it was three and i had probably done five or six hundred so she's like oh my gosh like you have like a 98 percent chance of winning she's like all you got to do is play more hmm. if you have a 98 percent chance of winning all you have to do is play more and she's like, if I had a 60% chance of winning in poker, I just need to get in the game and play more and I'll always win. So she's like, you have a total cheat code to life and business and you should just be doing more and more of these houses. And it's counterintuitive to what we think is like, we have to be careful and protection is the risk. Um, actually right. getting, putting our money out there, putting our time out there, not trying to protect what we have, but actually being aggressive from time to time is the game. And um, because knowing what we know, we definitely have a leg up and if we're winning 80 or 90% chance of the time, like it's not just, you can't just do one. You have to, go, if you go do a hundred, go do 50, you go do 20, like, you know, that you're going to offset all the, the, the one time that you lose. So, sure. Yeah. That makes um, sense. Hopefully that helps. But the biggest thing is uh, don't get stuck in the, oh, we have to top this one. Like okay. go back to the mentality of like, you know, it'd be cool. Even if we broke even, it'd be cool if we learned something new. Yeah. And, uh, and you're not missing out on something else because you say yes to something. So, uh, no, not a unicorn for sure. You'll make way more money on stuff down the road. Um, just the more you play, uh, the more chances that you have to, to, to best it or get close to it or, you know, learn something new. And eventually then you're like unstoppable after you've done enough of these that, and, but something always is going to come up. There's always something new. Like I, I made plenty of mistakes on a deal recently that, I shouldn't have made and I, I, there's no way I could have known. There's no way I could have known what was going on. Um, I've That's never terrifying. seen this before. I've never heard Wait of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, but Here, I'm, I'll tell you exactly what happened. Yeah. We have an apartment building in Nashville, Tennessee yeah. that we, that we bought like two years ago. Mm -hmm. And we knew we bought it in a really great area, downtown Nashville, where all this new construction is happening. All, we knew there's new buildings being built. There. There's new apartments. There's a new soccer stadium there. It's two years old. Mm -hmm. It is all this residential. It's it. This, this building was a great purchase. It's going to be worth way more money down the road. The problem is, as we're renovating it and bringing it to market, four other buildings come online at the same time, which mm -hmm. wouldn't be an issue because our apartment rents for like 13 or 1400 bucks a month and theirs rents for like 21 or 2200. Mm -hmm. So ours is way more affordable. Mm -hmm. The problem is they were giving away four months free rent to fill their apartment. So like how, I knew that I knew that absorption rates were going to be a, an issue there. I knew that other apartments were going to come online. I knew they would be more expensive. How could I possibly have known that they were going to attract everybody with four months free rent? And that there's four or 500 units that come online and we're trying to rent out ours. So right. who's going to rent a $1,300 a month, $1,400 a month apartment that's not as nice as the one for $2,200? But their consumer mentality, they don't care. Four months free rent. I don't care if I have to sign a one-year lease. They're going to be evicted three months after that, and they're going to come knocking on our door. Yeah. But ours are sitting vacant. So yeah. how could I possibly have known that? Right? And it's not yeah. totally killing me. It's just the fact that I can't distribute the cash flow to my investors and myself like I originally anticipated. So they just have to wait a little bit longer to get their money. Yeah. And so 
it's just, it's not a huge issue for us, but it's not hitting our business plan and our numbers as projected. I feel our, for your property so, manager. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, so you, I mean, you know that game, but yeah. like, I've never been in that situation. I've never heard somebody tell that story on a podcast before. It wasn't in our business plan or our prospectus. It, there's, I mean, we plan for everything else, but right. I mean, sometimes a COVID is going to happen. Sure. There's going to be a black swan that comes up that you're like, I couldn't, I mean, yeah. now I know. Yeah. So now we think about that. Is it possible? So now we're buying in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, an area where the sewer capacity is, is almost at capacity. So you are limited and can't build new construction there. So we won't have this problem again. Cool. That's awesome. That, that, that is one exciting thing about this, this business is as much planning as you do, right? You still have to be versatile and able to think on your feet and make moves quickly. Yeah. And totally. I find that exciting. Yeah. And you gotta, yeah. you just learn from this stuff. Like yeah. it's, it's, a, it's so fun. Yeah. It's like, ah, it's like a puzzle. Like, I don't know. Sometimes there's going to be a piece missing that you have to figure out how to, I love it. How to solve the problem. So problem solving. Okay. Uh, I have a couple more questions and I realize this is, this is like way longer than I anticipated, but I'm having a lot of fun. So hopefully everybody listening is too. Um, what, what about, you guys mentioned um, being in the runway program, some of the accountability calls. What is the thing that you think that you utilize the most and that could have potentially helped you in this, um, this deal? I think accountability has been huge. Um, I went to the, um, oh gosh, the masterminds in Tennessee a couple months ago. And before that, like, I didn't really participate much because I didn't know what I didn't know, you know, and I couldn't contribute. I didn't know the questions I should be asking. Uh, so what really helped was diving in on the, uh, the videos you guys have for the members, right? That kind of gave me a little bit of a groundwork, a little foundation on just, I mean, hell, all the acronyms you guys are using when you're talking about different things. I was completely clueless uh, at the beginning. But then, you know, with y'all's methodology and big shout out to Adam, uh, he's so calm and cool and explains everything so rationally. It all Whitney? just, Whitney, yes. Oh yeah, not, not my brother-in-law. He's, he's out at this point. Uh, <laughs> Adam Whitney. Uh, it's just, it, it's very like logical. Right. And it's been uh, refreshing to hear y'all's methodology um, in approaching a deal. And even those, um, oh, shoot, what, what does Adam call them when he does like the, we're going to run simulator through, simulators? Yes. Those have been eye opening too. Uh, I'll just be in, you know, driving somewhere and have that on the background and hear all these different things that could come up that I would never imagine could happen. And then talking through how to resolve those, those, potential issues and hurdles. Yeah, you missed a good one yesterday. I don't know if you had a chance to hear it yet, Bill, but it was a really good one yeah, yesterday. Yeah, I didn't get that one. Yeah. We all watched the replay. Adam's simulation from yesterday? Yeah, it was really good. He did this uh, simulation of, uh, and it was very relevant to us because mm -hmm. it was uh, based on a member who had been doing everything right, was grinding it out, had marketing, was investing a couple grand a month in her marketing, and I think four or five months in, still wasn't seeing any results, and then all of a sudden she gets two deals. And she had the mindset that she could only do one. And the question was, well, why? You know, what's the barrier? What could we do with these two deals? So that was a really cool uh, simulator because my mind went to, well, we'll do both because we want to get five so that we get 100% financing with Kiavi. But the group said, no, wholesale one and then flip the other ones. It was just such a good simulation that I didn't even think about wholesaling because we're still trying to wrap our brains around flipping. Um, so it's a good group to kind of push you beyond what you think you can do and then give you the tools and the resources when you need it. You know, right. like, like I phoned a friend, you know, I called Kara, could you please look at my request for repairs? And that was critical for us, even though we have a, a brother who's in your altitude group, you know, he's busy, he's doing his own thing. And he has said blatantly, I am not a coach. So being able to get the coaching from, from this group has been really helpful. Well, and I think it's also, you know, it's that it takes a village mentality, right? Like everyone's going through different things at different times and just, I don't know, hearing that you're not alone in this, <laughs> in this new business venture is, uh, is refreshing and reassuring for sure. Yeah. The biggest thing that I can say to anybody who is in the group that's listening is it's really easy that when things are going well, that you're talking to people and reaching out. So what I love Mel that you did was you phoned a friend, you had a point where you're like, I'm not exactly sure what to do. You share it with your accountability group and that you guys are participating in those. Like, you know, the accountability groups are optional, but I mean, they really shouldn't be, but they are like, I can't really force people to do it, but that's probably the one addition that we added to 
uh, to the program that has been really game changing and life changing for people. Like you get to do life together uh, mm-hmm. with some folks, get to know them. And then you kind of bounce around quarter to quarter to meet some new people. And, um, and, and a lot of times it's really easy to suffer in silence. So when things are not going well, it's easy to go internal. I see this happen all the time and we're all kind of driven type A people and we're not, we don't really feel comfortable being vulnerable and sharing some of the struggles and things. And so um, it really, it's easy to kind of go internal when things aren't going well. And that's the time where you need your tribe the most. And so you have to be able to reach out. You have to be able to raise your hand. And we try to do our best as a company to, if it's, if you've been quiet and you're normally allowed to reach out and see what's going on, just check in like, Hey, is everything okay? How can we help? Who can we connect you with? But that's really important. I see that in masterminds. I'm in lots of different groups and, and programs and coaching. And I have been for years is it's, it's so easy when things are not going well to just go quiet. So the biggest piece of advice I can give to anybody listening and potentially you guys in the future is when things aren't going well is when you need to be the loudest yeah. sure. and reach out and say, Hey, I need some help. I need some support. Has anybody been through this before? And then next thing you know, there's like three or four other people that, that speak up and like, I'm going through that right now too. And I'm going through that right now too. And I need help. And Hey, and then somebody's like, I can help all of you. And it just takes that one catalyst to say, hey, like something's off right now. Something's going on. I need some help. And it's, that's the time when people like, like fade into the darkness or try to leave or try to like disappear. And that's the time where you need to be the loudest. So um, easy to celebrate, really hard to ask for help and support. So, but that's what everybody's there for and everybody wants to be a part of it. So um, what would you say to somebody who is like, you know, thinking about getting into this business and, you um, and not sure. They're kind of like on the fence of whether they should even like get on a call with my team and find out more about Runway or or not. I mean, that was you, like 100%. That's because right, yeah. Mike's a film guy, you know, he he's not been interested in real estate. I mean, you. it's funny because our background is even before we met each other, our both of our first jobs separately, advertising agency for real estate builders randomly and then we went into different directions so you've had real estate kind of in your Mm -hmm. work life but you weren't sure about this you're like i don't know if i could do this i said i don't know if this is my jam well i i grew up where you know in a family where you buy your house it's it's a place you live it's not a place to make money right then i come out to california and i see all these people making tons of money on real estate i'm like wait a minute but let's rethink things here um seeing mel's family be really successful in it and then um, with Mel's brother saying, like, you should check out, you need to get coaching if we're really going to go for this. And he highly recommended 7F. And so a couple calls with, um, who was the guy we spoke with early on? I'm blanking on his name right now. I don't know. He was amazing. I'm blanking on his name too. Dave? Dave. Dave. That's exactly who we talked to. Dave. And just yeah. talking through, like, you know, just the different ways 7F could help. Uh, it was an absolute no brainer for us to, to join and really, you know, give this our all and not just try to do it on our own, but instead have a, a tribe of people that are also doing the same thing, going through the same struggles, um, learning the unknowns in real time. But also I think when you're getting started, if you're going to invest in a group like this, then you have skin in the game because it's not free. So if you're going to invest to be part of this elite group, then it forces you to make time for it. And I, I am still struggling with the balance of running my own company and then making my time for the coursework and doing it. So, but, I, but I'm going to do it, obviously, like we're, we're going to do it. But I think, I think if somebody can invest their money and their time and try it, why not? I mean, you have the blueprint, right? You're, we're going to get into it what we put into it. That's the thing. Like you guys aren't going to do it for us. So if you're going to do this, then, then commit to doing the work and rolling up your sleeves and, and getting in there because no one's going to do the work for you, but you've given us all the guidance and the guardrails to right. do it, but you mm-hmm. got to do it. So. Well, and, and, and I'm of the mindset of like, who better to invest in than yourself? Right. And, and oh, the seven F let's go. One. That's a good one. High that's five. a good one. <laughs> so like seven F was an investment in ourselves and it's, it's turned out to be a very, very good one so far. I love it. That's what my dad told me when I was like on the fence, I was like, this is the price of an Acura or a Honda. <laughs> like, and it's funny looking back on it. Now I compared it to a liability mm-hmm. instead of an asset. Sure. When I was thinking about it. I was like, I could buy a car. And I, and he was like, well, I mean, it sounds like you don't believe that you can do it, so you better just not. And I was like, okay, that's it. Now I'm doing it. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, because it was $25,000, and Mel, you're right. 
I, I remember, you know, making that investment and basically just going, okay, here we go. Mm -hmm. I'm going to suck everything I can out of this course. Yeah. And I'm going to be on the calls and I'm going to be, I'm going to make time for it. And I'm going to be up early and I'm going to be, you know, up late and I'm going to find all the time in between flying uh, to get this done. And uh, the other thing that I'll say to, to anybody who who's in the group or thinking about being in the group is there's a, there's like a lot to choose from now in there. There's a lot of stuff and it can be overwhelming, but it's, it's kind of like, like, going to the buffet, if you're not that hungry, just like pick the things that you need the most, that you're most interested in. And don't feel bad about like not watching all the videos or not coming to all the things or attending all the stuff. Or, you know, it's like, just go get what you need. And mm. that's the biggest thing that, that I did is I used the Facebook group a ton. And when I got started, there was like way less. Like we didn't, we didn't have food at the events. We didn't have like <laughs> nice uh, dinners. We didn't have any of that. So, yeah. I mean, Justin legitimately was like, oh crap, we got to run out and get snacks and waters for these people for lunch. And, and so um, it was just, it was pretty basic. It was like, you know, a, a couple calls and, and an event every quarter really. And um, some like minor videos in a Facebook group. And I spent all the time in the Facebook group and going to the events. That, that was it. And I just ask questions, ask a ton of questions. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? Hey, I've tried this. This is happening. Like, what should I do? And really just build the relationships with the people. And now there's so much, it's almost sometimes uh, too much for people. They get to the point where they're like, oh, like I, I got to make time for this and this. And it's not true. Like this course is designed to save time. Yeah. Right. And, and it's like, how can you go there and get what you need and go? Because my what I where I want you is out in the street working. Right. I want you out on the street. I want you talking to people. I want you making offers. I want you raising money and I want you doing deals. I don't want you sitting in front of a computer watching videos thinking that you've done something because you watch somebody else talk about them doing something. Right. So find the video that you need, grab the information that you need, jump on the accountability groups because that's important to right. be with your people and, and do some of the one-on-one -on -one coaching calls and then get out there and do the work and then come back with new information, new problems, mm -hmm. and then solve those new problems. And that's the cycle. So um, don't feel overwhelmed if you're not hitting it all. Uh, okay. If, if anybody that's watching or listening wants to uh, jump on a call with Dave or somebody else on the team, just go to sevenfigurerunway.com, the number sevenfigurerunway.com. And it's not like a hard pressure sales call. It's really just consultation. Like, hey, where are you at? Where do you want to be? The advice might be keep listening to the podcast. My advice might be go to the YouTube channel. It's not time for you yet. Uh, it might be come to some of the free events that we're doing. Or it might be, hey, if you really are serious about this business and you do want to grow it, then you know, jump into the runway program with us. This sounds like the right time for you. So uh, we'll do our best to point you in the right direction and uh, listen to your story and find out, you know, where we think that we can help you the most. So, um, okay, what do you guys need? Is there anything that you can, you need? Uh, we have a whole audience here, a whole email list that'll read this. Like, is it, can they get a hold of you somehow? Is there something that you guys need? Uh, well, what we need is to find our next flip. We do. We need to find our next flip. <laughs> okay. You need a deal where? Where do you need a deal? So we're, we're Southern California from Barstow to Mexico, basically. So and you'll take Mexico. something to Mexico? Mexico, no, just north of Mexico, the border of Mexico. Yeah. I mean, we're very okay. close to Mexico. It's 30 we minutes from yeah. us. Um, you'll take Temecula, Imperial oh, Beach. Oh, definitely. That's where oh, for my property management company, our headquarters are in Temecula. So we're very cool. familiar with Temecula, Murrieta, Elsmar, Hemet. I would love to do things a little closer to us. And that is one thing I learned on the um, simulator call yesterday. There was a member in there named Sarah. She's, I don't know. She might not appreciate me calling her out, but she's in California somewhere. She's doing million dollar flips. In, in California, which blew my mind. I wasn't even in my sphere of thinking that we could do something like that. And I thought we might be priced out of San Diego, but now that we're in this group longer, I don't think we are. So I'd love to do a flip in San Diego if we yeah. can. Temecula would be great. Um, yeah. Anywhere within cool. three hours of San right. Diego, Arizona. So if you're listening and you have a deal in Southern California from Barstow to Mexico, not in Mexico right now, but maybe in the future, they'll take some pesos. Um, reach out to Mike and Mel. How can they get a hold of you if they have a deal or they want to reach out? Our website is tacosidproperties.com. Um, email tacosidproperties at gmail. And uh, phone number 310-893-3922. Cool. Um, well, I had a great time. I hope you guys did too. Uh, this was like a uh, coffee talk with Mike and Mel. It was really <laughs> fun. Uh, I had a great time. And uh, if you want to find out more about the runway program, we'd love to have you. We have an event coming up in May. Um, we're doing some really cool stuff with our seven figure foundation beforehand. We got a charity event that night. Um, the first night of the 
like the night before the runway event and the day before the runway event, we have a mission trip here in Nashville, Tennessee, where we're going to be building beds for families in needs that don't have beds. Uh, really great uh, what we're doing with the foundations. We're giving the runway group an opportunity to do that the day before their event uh, on May 2nd. And then the event is on May 3rd and 4th. So we'd love to have you. You can go to the number sevenfigurerunway.com. So sevenfigurerunway.com. And uh, or reply to us in the email or comment on the video or wherever you're seeing this. Um, we'd love to have you. And uh, we'll see you on the next show. Mike and Mel, thanks for being here. See you. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Bye. bro.